Hey everyone, welcome to the Building Plugins for Zoyo session. My name is William Yu and I'm a software engineer here at Zoyo. And today we're going to talk about plugins. But first, a little bit about me. I'm here based in Austin, Texas. I've been working at Zoyo for over 20 years now. I have a beautiful family with three crazy kids. It keeps us highly entertained or highly stressed, not sure which most of the time. So whenever someone asks me if it's complicated to create plugins for Zojo, I say having kids and taking care of them is a lot more challenging. So if you have any kids, kudos to you. There's a lot to cover in this session, so let's dive right into it. The first thing we should do is to set up our environment and download the necessary development tools. For the Mac, this means downloading Xcode, which you can obtain on the Mac App Store. On Windows, we use Visual Studio 2022. And on Linux, we use Clang, although GCC should work just as well. For ease of cross-platform and cross-architecture development, a single M1 MacBook or Mac Mini with parallels to host your Windows and Linux VMs would be all you need. This will let you develop and test for all the support platforms that we support, even Raspberry Pi if you set up a cross-compiling toolchain on Linux. The next thing we'll need is our plugins SDK. For this session, we'll use the latest one from 2022, release one. This can be found in the extras folder, which I'll go ahead and copy out to the desktop. Taking a quick glance at the plugins SDK, we see a bunch of header files and two glue code files. Some of the header files are simple prefix headers, so they're not strictly necessary, but we maintain them for backwards compatibility. Also, if you look at the names of our APIs and even the names of our header files, they still maintain the old real or RB prefix, which predates our Zojo name change. You should be able to just include the RB underscore plugin H file, which pulls in a few other necessary header files along with it. As for the glue code, you'll always need to add plugin main.cpp to your project. This is how your plugins will communicate with the framework. Plugin main Coco is specific to plugin controls on macOS and is only necessary if you plan on hosting NSView based controls. We'll touch on this a bit later when we take a closer look at one of the examples, but just these few files make up our SDK. We also include some Doctogen generated offline documentation, including recent release notes. One helpful section that we'll go over in this video is about the plugin packaging format. But for now, the best way to learn how everything works is generally through examples. So we'll go over a few in this session. Let's take a look at an example included with the plugins SDK. This is the complete module example. And we'll go ahead and open up the Xcode project to take a quick look at it. As you can see here, this project includes all our necessary header and glue code files. The only project setting worth mentioning here is the prefix header. As we talked about before, we include a few of these prefix headers for convenience sake. Let's go ahead and open up our complete module source file. And we'll just scroll all the way down until we find our plugin entry. This is where you'll add your code to register your modules, classes, or controls by calling one of our real register APIs. In this example, we'll be registering a module this lets our ID know about this new module for purposes of all complete and how to build it. Now let's take a look at this test module definition. This is just a structure that defines all the necessary bits that this module supports. The first thing in this structure is a version field. This defines the lowest version of Zojo that your plugin will support. So if you only care about supporting the current version of Zojo, then always use the K current real control version constant. If you wanted to support older versions of Zojo, the easiest way would be to download that particular version of Zojo and use a plugins SDK that's shipped with it. After the version field, we then get to define the name of our module and what methods, properties, and constants it supports. Jumping right into the method definition, we see another structure that defines what this method looks like. The first field is a function pointer that is invoked when the user calls this module method. Well, a second is another function pointer that is invoked when the user assigns a value to this method. This is like adding a function in Zojo with the signs keyword. 
However, in this particular example, we don't have a setter, so we can just assign a real no encryptation, meaning there is no setter. In this example, we're writing up a method definition called play with cat and passing in a toy name as string. We'll take a look at what this function definition looks like in a little bit. The next field worth mentioning is what we call our flags field. This defines the scope and target for the method. In this example, we have defined a single flag that tells our IDE that this method is safe to build for console apps, which include web. The list of scope and target flags can be found in our header files. Now that we understand the basic structure of our method definition, let's take a look at the underlying code that is invoked when the user calls this method. The first thing we note is that this function takes a Zojo string. We don't document the data structure for these opaque types for obvious reasons, but we provide several conveniently defined types to deal with them. In this case, the Zojo string is a real string type. We'll take a peek at what this message box function is really doing. In here, we see another plugin SDK method being invoked. This is demonstrating what we call our dynamic access API. As long as you know the function definition of what you want invoked, you can simply pass that into one of our real load dynamic access APIs to get a function pointer to it. Before this, we only had our stack APIs, which meant only certain APIs were accessible from your plugin, depending on when and if we added more. Now with the dynamic access API, you're able to access almost anything within our framework. Now that we've had a quick peek at this complete module, let's try building it and see what we need to do to start using this new module. Depending on your Xcode preferences, we'll go ahead and grab the newly built Dilib and move it into the plugins folder next to the Zojo IDE. You'll notice that we haven't packaged this Dilib into our plugin format yet. We'll go over the details on how to do that in a minute. But for this example, we only want to test this plugin on Mac OS, so there's no need to package this up. The same is true if you were using the Windows or Linux IDs. Just copy over the DLL or shared library file into your plugins folder for ease of testing. If you want to make sure your plugin loaded correctly, go up to the About box and select the Loaded Plugins tab. In here, you should find your plugin. But if for whatever reason it cannot be loaded, you would still see your plugin listed here, but in red with hopefully a descriptive error message as to why it cannot be loaded. Now let's go ahead and try and use this newly registered module. If you remember, we named this new module test module. We'll bring up the autocomplete for this and pick one of the functions to test. In this example, we'll test the play with cat method. And if you remember from looking at the source code, this method should bring up a message box with a toy name string. And there you have a successful first plugin built and tested. Now a quick note about our compiler. Since it does cache pre-built plugins, it is always a good idea to clear the caches anytime you modify the definitions of your plugin. For example, if we added a new method to test module, that changes the definition. So the compiler needs to rebuild its cache. Thankfully, this can be done by bringing up the preferences dialog and selecting clear caches. Just remember to restart the ID after this. Since we've only built this complete module plugin for Mac OS, trying to build a Windows app that uses this module will fail with the compiler error. So let's next look at building this plugin for Windows and package this up in our plugin format so we can build Windows apps with it. Here we have the complete module project loaded in Visual Studio 2022. This project is set up to build a Win32 DLL with the stack runtime libraries. But if you wanted to reduce the size of your DLL, you could select the dynamic runtime libraries instead, since we already include all the necessary runtime libraries when the user builds a Windows app in Zojo. If you're interested in building plugins that use the .NET framework, we also have example projects in our plugins SDK to demonstrate how that works. So we got our complete module plugin built on Windows, let's copy this DLL over to our plugins folder where we already have our macOS part built. Here we'll package these parts into the documented plugin format that our ID understands. In this example, we've got the 64-bit Intel versions built for macOS and Windows, so we'll want to include those two directories in our build resources. As documented, we can either zip up the plugin directories or just build them like regular folders. Here, we start off with a top level folder. And in this folder, we just have one plugin part to include, and that is our complete module plugin. We'll then add the build resource folder. 
and the appropriate Mac OS and Windows build pieces. Now that we've got our folder structure built, we can go back to find our built pieces and then move them into their respective folders. After that's all set up, let's go ahead and launch Zojo again. Then going back to our previous project, but this time building for Windows. If all goes well, then congratulations. You have just successfully built a cross-platform plugin for Zojo. Now let's briefly go over a few of the more advanced topics. Again, the best way to learn is to study our examples. So let's open up the iControl project to see how we register controls. Like our module example, to register a control, we use the Real Register Control API. You can look over our real control structure for some descriptions. Although we may find a few fields with unusual names. These are preserved for backwards compatibility reasons. But looking over the examples is one way to decipher some of these. In this particular case, the control icon is just a magic number with a corresponding image file of the same number. This is the image of your control that's added to the library list in the ID. One of the fields in our real control structure is the real control behavior field. You'll implement the ones that are relevant to your control while leaving others blank. In this particular example, we care about painting our control and handling clicks. You'll see two painting options, one to paint a runtime and one to paint off screen, which is triggered when the user calls a draw into method on your control. This is also used when drawing your control in the IE layout editor. And by using our dynamic access API, we can perform all our drawing using our built-in framework code. The last thing worth mentioning is something we added for our desktop API 2.0 transition. Any control names with a desktop prefix will have that prefix stripped when shown in the library list. Note that this does not affect the actual class name. Before API 2.0, all plugin controls inherited from control or rec control. Now you can explicitly subscribe to the new API 2.0 by adding the real desktop control flag. Now your controls will inherit from the new desktop control or desktop UI control instead of the deprecated control and rec control. In this next example, we'll take a look at how you can host native controls in your plugins. For this, we'll open up our hosted plugin example, which demonstrates how you can host an NSVU based control on macOS. As we mentioned early on, most plugins will only need to add the plugin main.cpp file to the project. But for hosted controls, at least on macOS, you'll want to also add the plugin main Coco file as well. We'll explain why in a minute, but first, how do you tell Zojo that this is a native control? Let's go back to our real control behavior structure. You'll see that one of the fields is a control handling editor. If you're hosting a native control, what you want to do in this function is to return your NSView control on macOS, a Win32 control handle on Windows, or a GDK widget on Linux. In this example, we're creating an NS level indicator control. When we dive right into the implementation details, we see a few macros that are set up explicitly to forward events to our framework for processing. This is the main reason for including plugin main Coco. Failure to forward these events to our framework will mean a failure in triggering certain events for your plugin. So previously in some of our examples, we demonstrated how you can use our dynamic access APIs to invoke global methods like our message box, or to invoke methods on objects like our graphics class. While some classes will always be available, for example, whenever you build a desktop app, the graphics class will always be accessible because all desktop apps require this for painting. However, not all classes are linked in, especially if they are not used. So if your plugin requires a certain class to be available, you should tell our compiler about this dependency by adding a real get class ref call in your plugin entry function. This will provide the hint necessary for a compiler to link in the class. While there's so much more we could cover, I hope that this at least gives you a better understanding of how to create cross-platform plugins for Zojo. Study the examples and feel free to ask questions on our forums. We're all here to learn and help. Thanks for watching and happy coding.